All right, how you doing, Ben? I am good. Had a little bit of uh, trouble with our video here, but I think we're good to go now. And so here we are. Fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, I can't help myself. You know how I am. So a, a few of these questions I'm going to be asking you for my for my viewers are going to be a little bit uh, smart ass, but <laughs> good, good. So um, first off, before we go any further. What can you tell me about yourself? Who are you? Uh, I am a unique character, if you will. No, so uh, I'm 39 years old, uh, married, got three little ones, um, own a couple gyms. Um, I started uh, competing uh, about 15 years ago. I actually started strength training at the age of 12. Um, I have predominantly just done bodybuilding. Um, I originally started off with strength training for soccer and baseball, actually. Um, I was a great soccer player. Um, ironically, I actually graduated high school about 135 pounds. Um, I float right now between 225 and 228. So I've you know pretty much maintained about 100 pounds heavier uh, since what I was when I graduated high school. Um, but predominantly, I just run business. That's pretty much all I do at this point. Just do business. Yeah. No, I've so I've got some MRT stuff uh, that I do as well. We can kind of get into that later. Uh, do a lot of rehab um, application, a lot of strength training on the new X. Again, we'll kind of get into that here in a second. But I've kind of shifted a little bit away from uh, the competitive side. I do. I do have a couple athletes I'm training. I'm actually one of my training partner right now. He is as well an IFPB pro. Uh, we just started dieting him actually today for the Indy Pro. Um, so that's kind of the next big thing on my list to try and make a splash with him. So that's the other thing is it's not one of the things that I can honestly say as a as a criticism of mine for other professional athletes, whether they're bodybuilders or powerlifters or whatever, is as me and you both know, some people just have a genetic advantage. I mean, obviously they have to do the work, but some guys, they can just kind of do whatever and they're going to see great results, you know? <laughs> right, right. Another thing is that there's a difference between learning your own body and being able to figure out what works for you, despite whatever your genetics may be, and then understanding how to get the most out of a client or somebody else. You know, the, the stuff that works for me is not the exact same thing I need to generically apply to everybody else. That's not how it works. Right, right. It's not just that you yourself have found success and you've obviously figured out what works for you because you were able to get your own pro card, but you actually have years, if not what decades now of experience of directly training other people. And it's not just for one purpose. It's not like all you do is bodybuilders. If it's bodybuilding, you've trained people from being the guy off the street to being an IFBB pro. You've seen that entire journey all the way through. You've trained people for strength gaining. You've trained people specifically for rehabilitation. You've trained people specifically for weight loss. And man and woman, old and young, like you understand the, the individual nuances for each person depending on who they are and what their goals are. Yeah, so I've been very, very fortunate. I've always just happened to have been around very, very uh, intelligent individuals that that I did my best to act like a sponge around. Um, I stayed quiet. I listened to what they had to say. I watched their applications, um, picked up what they were doing. Um, so what I'm doing now, you know, is kind of a culmination of, of all that. And it's been a lot of fun. Um, I am not that smart. I am regurgitating a lot of information um, from other coaches that are a lot smarter than I am. Um, I do have other coaches that I reach out to. It's it's not just a me thing. And, and I think that's where uh, my issue is in the coaching realm, period. Everybody wants to think that they know everything. And, it, you know, in a sport, like we'll, we'll use bodybuilding. Though it's such an individual sport, it really is a massive team effort um, from chiropractic stuff to massage stuff to you know, rehab stuff that I'm doing to a nutritionist to a trainer to athletic training. There's there's so many things involved with it that it's very, very critical to have those relationships with other individuals. So, you know, as, as I'm training an athlete, if they're coming up with an issue, I can uh, refer them to the right person if they're having you know, a knee issue that, that I can't handle in-house or if they're having uh, a hormone issue that's happening. I've got endocrinologists that I can call. I make sure that they're referred to get blood work done. Like there's, it, you know, this is 
been a huge culmination over over the years of of gathering this team together. Um, and I think that's what actually makes me so, so so successful with my coaching isn't that I don't rely on mine. I rely on my team to get you know everyone there. Even even your your average weight loss person, you, you lose fifty pounds, and all of a sudden their hormones are completely out of whack. So I I work closely with a hormone replacement therapy team that's on the south side of Indy. You know that that I refer them to there because you know when you're talking somebody's losing fifty or hundred pounds of body fat their hormones are going to be all over the place. Maybe one of the reasons they gained so much weight was because of the fact that their hormones were out of whack. Um, now, I know I digress a little bit here as I go off on that tangent, but that's just, that's just a small example of, of what we've done to get people where they're at. And again, not to be that guy, but I've been around some of the biggest and strongest people on the planet for a majority of my lifetime. And one of the things that I've always noticed, and it's no surprise to most people, is there's a certain amount of ego that comes with that territory. When you're one of the top benchers in the world, there's ego attached to that. Whenever you are competing in a bodybuilding show, you know, and you're in, in, at the Olympia, there's ego attached to that. But one of the things that struck me about you is I still remember when I met you for the first time, what was it, like... Uh, 10 plus years ago, you, you saw a broken leg. You were, you were actually, I saw you in the gym and you had your crutches crisscrossed, leaned up against the bench as you were using the dumbbells. <laughs> did I have, did I have my air cast on at that point or did I have the air cast off? Uh, you still had the cast on. Yeah. Yeah. I still had that air cast on. That's right. So that'd been, that had been in 2012. One of the things I, I noticed right away was as I started talking to you, I already had this preconception of basically how the conversation is going to go because it's how it almost always goes when you got two guys in the gym talking for the first time there's a little bit of sizing up there's a little bit of ego there's a little bit of oh, 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 who's going to be the alpha that that who, who's doing what yeah yeah you were genuinely just laid back and cool and had no ego attached and since i've known you the whole time i've known you as you were just pointing out I've never heard you brag about anything. I've never heard you show off about anything. I've never heard you have this this conception that you're the smartest, you know it all, everybody else is dumb. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. It was only this past year that I was talking to you about welding and I said, hey Ben, have you ever considered learning about welding? And you were like, oh yeah, I forgot to mention. <laughs> and it turns out you're a phenomenal welder who's actually very good at the craft, used to do it for a living, and I had no idea because as much as you see me building gym equipment and welding, you never even had this concept of saying, well, I do that too. You just, you just don't, you don't really talk about yourself. You know, I was raised very uniquely. Uh, my dad always, always from a very young age pounded into my head that it doesn't matter how you good you are, how strong you are, how fast you are, any of that. There is always someone out there stronger, faster, better, smarter, whatever. And, you know, he just always raised me with humility will take you a very long way. And, you know, I watched him do that while he was on the fire department. Um, I watched him with his painting business that he owned for 30 years. Even back in 2008, when he had the, we had the housing recession, you know, he still had a six month waiting list for his painting business. And, and, and I remember that was, that was probably when it really set into me just how important humility is and how much farther it will take you than ego. Um, so I've just really tried to to keep that adopted um, in, in, in all aspects, whether it's with the business, with the bodybuilding, um, parenting, whatever, because there's always going to be somewhere out there you're gonna, just just like with, with the equipment thing, you're gonna, gonna talk to someone, you're like, oh my God, I had no idea that you knew that much with that. Um, just always try to keep that humility in line. Well, if you don't mind, I've, I've written on my, my notebook here some of the common questions or comments or topics that I get most often basically every single day from hundreds of people at this point. And some of them were specifically directed in the sense of, hey, ask your bodybuilder friend about that. Other ones were just asking me and I'm like, well, I'll let you take over. So if, if you're all right with that, I'm going to ask you some of these questions. Yeah. Yeah, let's fire away. Let's see what, what kind of myths we can turn on the heads. All right. Well, the first thing I, I read a lot isn't so much of a question as it's kind of a statement. And you can elaborate as much as you want with any of these, or you can keep it short, your choice. But the basic concept or comment goes like this. The more I train abs, the smaller my waist will be, and the more fat I will lose. 
To lose fat and get a tiny waist, I just need to train the crap out of my abs. Man, if I had a penny for every time that I heard this. So I'm gonna make it as simple as possible. If you're wanting to make your arms grow, if you're wanting to make your chest grow, if you're wanting to make your legs grow, what you do is you train them, okay? And you train them hard, you train them heavy, and that's what people typically try to do with their abs. The issue is they're not doing anything in the, in the kitchen to counter any type of eating. So when they do this, all they're doing is increasing the muscle size underneath the fat, which is all it's doing is pushing body fat out. There's no such thing as isolated fat reduction. Um, I actually do very, very little abs. Um, most of what I do ab wise actually comes from, you know, when I'm doing a heavy tricep set, my core's engaged as I'm, as I'm pressing down. So, you know, the concept of doing abs, do I believe in them? Yeah, but when I do do them, it's, it's like, hanging leg raises or something like that. It, it is nothing crazy. And if I wanna see my abs, I take myself to the kitchen, I get my, my diet righted. Um, depending on where I'm at, I may, may introduce some uh, additional cardio on top of what I'm already doing. Um, but, but the concept of uh, doing crunches and, and weighted abdominal exercises to find abs um, is exponentially frustrating and, and not true. Yeah, and uh, and again, kind of like with the uh, the approach to to exercise or abs or anything else, with diet, there is no universal truth. The guy who's uh, who again, depending on the experience level or who you are or what your goals are, um, and even maybe your individual genetics. You know, people who who have some people just, for example, they they handle dairy better than other people. You know, some people handle certain foods or respond to certain things better than other things. So there is no magical uh, diet for everybody. There is no magical f uh, answer to always eat this, never eat this. Like there's there are individual nuances. Right. And, and, you know, speaking of individual nuances, you know, too, like something that I, I think people need to understand, too, is, you know, usually the first place you gain the body fat is going to be the last place you lose it. Um, with me, for whatever reason, my abs when I'm dieting for show are the very first to come in. My glutes and, and, and hamstrings are the absolute last thing. You know, Chad, his glutes and hams, they're, they're almost in year round, but it's the abdominal fat that takes a little bit longer to pull off. So that's another thing to consider well, as you were talking about genetics, like you never know where your body's going to pull it off and where it's going to fight it. So trying to compare yourself to someone else or your nutrition plan to someone else, you may be a fats person, they may be a carbs person, all that plays into how your body is going to reduce body fats. Um, so when someone says, well, I'm just going to do abs to spot reduce in my stomach, I'm like, hmm, there's so much more to that than just crunching. Well, moving on, this is one that I could not wait to speak with you about. Okay. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about this. Oh boy. <laughs> all right. The very first thing I hear all the time, I read it all the time. I have people commenting on my videos, people sending me messages. The statement goes something like this. Everyone knows that low reps will bulk up your muscles and high reps will tone your muscles. <laughs> I, I see the face you're making. That's a good sign. Obviously, they're onto something. Now, the next statement being... Do, do, do you, I was going to say, okay, I'll, I'll wait till you get them all out. Okay, go ahead. The next statement being, anything above 12 reps is too high and you will not build muscle. Okay. I would highly advise never hiring them as a coach. That's where I'd start. <laughs> um, I mean, do you want to talk about today's leg day that I did? I mean, that that'll we can just start start there. So let me give you some let me let me give you some backstory first, so, so you'll understand where this um, passion came from. Uh, 2015, I was at North Americans. Uh, I was light heavyweight. I'm looking to get my pro card. Uh, there were 48 guys in my class at that time. Uh, Mitch Stats actually ended up winning that year. Phenomenal athlete. I've actually competed with him here at the Indy Pro. Uh, super great guy. Um, 
But basically, I ended up getting 22nd place, um, which is fine, whatever. I was not the best guy that day. I knew it. Uh, the, the, those guys were absolute monsters. They earned their place. He's not even upset about that. So you actually can, you can, you can email the judges, send them your pictures, send them your number, ask them for critiques. Uh, and basically what I was told was I had a pro level upper and a national level lower. And I'm not one much to get my feelings hurt. I just go to work. So I made it my personal vendetta that I would have the best legs, uh, not just in my class, but at that, sh whatever show I did next, there would be no question at all that my legs were there. Um, so I'm going to talk about today's leg day, uh, which mimics very closely to some other stuff I used to do. We, we can just talk about those. But like today, I literally warmed up with a quarter mile of walking lunges, nonstop quarter mile walking lunges, um, basically around the building. Got back and... <laughs> I'm no mathematician, but it occurs to me that in order to do a lunge repetitively over the course of a quarter mile, you may have done it more than 12 times. Am I hearing that correctly? You are. Uh, what what some of your viewers may not know, I'm a, I'm a staggering five foot six. Uh, so I do not have a large um, wingspan or foot drill. So yes, I probably did maybe 13 reps, maybe. Oh no, oh no, lost all the game. So yes. Uh. <laughs> so, so did a quarter mile, um, and and you laugh when I tell you that this that was a light day because normally we do more rounds of that. But that's for for another story. Came in, got on leg extension. Um, I didn't pick much weight, fifty pounds, sixty pounds, something like that. And my first set was a hundred reps. Um, it wasn't a hundred reps for the exercise. That was your first set. Correct. That was set one. Uh, and, and for all intents and purposes, my warm up, <laughs> my warm up. Um, so I got through about 60 reps. <laughs> uh, literally, I, if I pause, I take two breaths and go right back into the movement. Um, because the whole purpose is try to get as many, uh, get, as, get as far through the 100 as possible. Usually, if I get much more than 60, I've probably gone too light before I take my first pause. Somewhere between 40 and 60 reps. Um, finish those out. Uh, then uh, my second set, I do something called 7-Ups. Um, I don't actually know what the, the real name of it is for them is, um, it's just something I started doing a few years ago. So basically what I did is I started 30 pounds, I did seven reps, added a plate, did seven reps, and these are consecutive. They're, it's not like I'm resting in between. My rest period is literally as long as it takes to adjust the weight. So I'll do seven, add weight, do seven, add weight, do seven, add weight, do seven, add weight. Literally do it till I can't do seven, and then immediately drop it a plate, do it as many as I can, or if I can get seven, drop it again, do as many as I can, drop it again, do as many as I can, all the way back down. So that's set two. Um, usually I can do about five to seven uh, sets going up before I come back down. So we'll, we'll say we'll say 10 sets total. So you're, there's you know another 70 reps, but again, it's progressive overload uh, and then, then deload. Um, then I go into something called a two minute drill uh, this is a fun one. This is a this is a, a big mental one for me. So basically, what I do is is I put a weight on, um, usually somewhere in the three hundred range, something there. Nothing crazy by any means. And what I'll do is I'll take three to four seconds on both the eccentric and concentric part of the movement. I never lock out. I never rest at the bottom. And the the purpose is to go the entire two minutes without stopping. Two seconds, up, two three seconds up two to three seconds down. Um, my seconds are slow, so I say three to four because usually when I count two seconds, people are like, one, two, one, two. I'm like, yeah, that was definitely not two seconds. Um, so get through that two minute drill. And then we have like, a, it's like a, a, Scott, I don't know if you've seen, it's a Magnum squat machine. It's almost like a, something that's like a front squat. Um, and what I do is I do um, split squats with it. So I'll keep one foot on the platform. I'll step back basically into a lunge. Uh, and I'll do 10 of those on the right leg, 10 of them on the left leg. And then I superseted it uh, with 20 uh, hack squats. Did about four rounds of that. And then I ended with lion hamstring curls uh, for 15 to 20 reps, immediately supersetted. Uh, I've got turf at our gym. It's 120 foot long. So I threw a 45 um, 
245s on the sled all the way down, all the way back. That was set one, did about three or four rounds of that. And, and that was my leg day. So um, I probably did a couple more than 12 reps on most of my sets. All right, so yeah, what I'm hearing is that essentially you're doing stuff where you honestly don't know how many actual reps you did. It's more about a certain distance or a certain time. And then when you are counting the reps, they're what most people is safe to say that the average person would consider high reps or too high or impossibly high. Correct. So um, this was my thought process. So, you know, after, after I got my, uh, you know, butt handed to me, I, I started going back and processing, you know, cause I had trained heavy, you know, I was, you know, squatting hard, doing, doing that typical, you know, eight to 12 rep range, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't get it. Like, this doesn't make sense. Like I'm, I'm having hard leg days. I'm doing, you know, six sets, 10 sets of 10. Like this, this doesn't make any sense. Then it occurred to me, you know, I, I'm not sure how typical this is overseas, but you, you've seen in America, when you see an obese person, every one of them has massive calves, right? They all have these massive calves. Well, why is that? because they're carrying extreme loads all day long. Well, there's, there's something, there's a commonality, right? So when I started increasing my volume and really focusing on time under tension and just massive overload for hour, hour and a half with as extreme weight as I could handle for that, um, that's really when I started seeing the leg growth. I did that for literally two years went back masters, won my pro card, um, almost won um, my 35 to 39 division overall um, and ended up, I had several compliments of having best stage on, best legs on stage at that show. And I, I a thousand percent accredit it to that, that little epiphany that I had. Which is an, a good time to also remind people that when I met you, you had a broken leg. <laughs> yeah. So you haven't just built good legs, but you've had to come back from the fact that one of them was pretty badly atrophied. I my right leg ended up being about three inches smaller than my left when it when it was all said and done. And um so after I broke that tib fib, um about it was, it was just under three weeks, somewhere between two and three weeks. Uh, I ended up going back to the gym and, and I actually leg pressed for the first time about 18 days after that rod was put in my leg. And uh, right before right before I started training that week, I had made a decision that not only was I going to come back, um, but I was going to come back as the best me I ever had. And uh, I was actually blessed enough, uh, Ten almost 10 months to the day of my surgery later, I ended up winning Mr. Indiana. And it's even more crazy because we all know that you can't build muscle with more than 12 reps. So considering the fact that you won despite doing everything wrong is really crazy. Right, right. Yeah, I just, I completely, obviously did it, did it all wrong, um, clearly. This idea of overtraining is so, is so rampant these days that basically, I think people get kind of paralyzed by fear and they're so worried that they're gonna be doing too much that they end up way, way, way under shooting and not doing nearly enough. And the moment you suggest increasing anything, whether it's a reps or sets or volume, frequency, anything, they immediately freeze up and they don't wanna listen. They say, oh no, that's, that's overtraining, I can't do that. I'm a woman or I'm a man or I'm young or I'm old or I've had an injury before. Insert excuse here, I can't do that because it'll be overtraining. Right, and, and I'm not really sure what where this spawned from. I don't really know where this mentality came from or how it becomes so widespread. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of the things and nuances here that we're talking about, I'm, you're talking about from a professional athlete standpoint, but it, it it is really, really hard to overtrain. Like, you know, I'll, I'll send you, I think I actually sent you earlier the video of leg day from, from my old location. Literally other than Chad and I, everyone else is normal people in there doing my leg day with me. They're literally doing my leg day with me. Now granted, yes, Everyone in there is on a good nutrition plan. Everyone in there is eating correctly. Everyone in there is resting well. And I think that's a topic where we start to confuse it. I think that's where we lose people in transition is 
rest is important and it's even more important as you become tired. Um, but we get so focused on, oh, don't do, don't do too much, don't do too much. Well, no, you can absolutely plow through workouts, especially if your nutrition plan and your, and your rest periods are on point. If they're not, then yeah, you probably need to take a few days off. There have literally been stretches where I've trained 20, 30 days straight in a row. I just felt good. I was like, I just, I'm feeling good today. I'm not overly sore. Like things are just feeling great. And then all of a sudden it was like, I hit a wall. I took a week off, <gasps> right? Oh my gosh, I didn't train for a week. No, took that week off, came back a week later. I was so strong and healthy and motivated, both physically well and mentally well. Like, no, granted, I understand I've done it a long time. I've, I, you know, I, I understand those nuances of my body, but if, if, you're, if you're getting unmotivated and you're struggling to get to your workout, you're struggling to get through your workout, then yeah, take a few days off. But I think more people get nervous of the pain. Ooh, it hurts. Oh, I'm sore than they are of actually overtraining. Absolutely. And uh, that actually comes into the next thing I hear a lot, which I was going to ask you about, was just generally um, just diet stuff. The, the average person who's, you know, trying to they're not, they're not competitive athlete. They're the average person, maybe middle-aged or a little older, just like the average person, right? They're, they're training because they want to feel healthy. They want to lose some body fat. They want to build some muscle. They want to, they want to feel good and look good and improve their quality of life. Then what is some general just diet advice you'd give them? What should they be thinking or how should they be approaching this concept of diet? So great question. So I, I'm going to answer this as if I was literally talking to you that you you just like, hey, you're a new online client. I'm getting ready to work with you. These are things we're going to topic. We're going to we're going to attack. My first thing is I'm actually going to have you keep a food log for a week. OK, track everything, because that's going to show me what you're normally doing. It's going to show me what you're normally eating. It's going to show me your habits. So, for example, if I get that food log and you're only eating twice a week or twice a day, I, my first goal is going to get you to eating three to four times a day. I, at that moment, I actually don't even care what because you're already under eating and not doing what you need to be. Now that I've got you eating three or four times a day, now I'm going to start to hone in on what you're eating. So based on what you, you, you provided me, it's going to tell me what type of person you are. So what I mean by that, are you a carbs person or are you a fats person? And that's very, very important to understand as you're writing the nutrition plan out, because if you predominantly like cheeseburgers, pizzas, um, potato chips, you know, nuts, things like that, you're a fats person. So whatever diet we write, it's got to be a heavy fats and lower on the carbs because that's what your body naturally is going towards. If you're eating breads, if you're eating um, ice cream, cakes, things like that, you're going to be more of a carbs person. So when I write that nutrition plan, I'm going to write it heavy in the carbs because the whole purpose of that is keep the cortisol level down as absolute much as possible. The more that we keep your body at rest, the, the better it's going to perform for us, the easier it's going to add muscle, the faster it's going to drop body fat, you're going to physically feel better. Um, so you know, when, I, when I very first start with someone, I have to understand what their body craves first before I can even give them nutritional advice on what to take in. The last part, I saved this for last because most of the things I want to talk to you about are just general advice. These are things that I want people to be able to listen to and, and apply to their lifestyle or their gym stuff, no matter where they go or what they do. And people always have the same approach. They, they either think that the piece of equipment that you use whether it's free weights or a machine or it's a home gym or a commercial gym or a total gym or whatever else, they they have this concept that the specific piece of equipment that you use is going to make, make or break your workout. The idea being like me doing cable tricep extensions with a total gym is totally ineffective, but doing the exact same reps, sets, intensity level, volume, frequency, tricep extensions on a cable crossover machine, well now I'm gonna have huge triceps. So all else being equal, because I use this piece of equipment and not this piece of equipment, now, I'm, now I can't do anything, I'm just wasting my time. So there's two components there. Uh, there's a mental side 
and the physical side. So I'm going to leave the mental side out for a second because that could be for a whole other video interview for you and I and thought processes and speaking things into existence and all that stuff. So I, I won't I won't beat that horse too bad. Um, but I, here's the best example that I'm ever going to give. Um, when, when people start wrapping their head around, if I don't have this, then I can't do that. I'm sure everyone's familiar with who Dexter Jackson is. Okay. One Mr. Olympia, he is the all time winningest IFBB pro ever. Okay. His entire Olympia prep this year was done on Bowflex. I didn't know that. That's incredible. Yes. It was like, yes, they went to the gym a couple times, but about 95% of his workouts were done on a Bowflex. So, yes, he used a new X. That's for a little bit more conversation. But my point to that is you have a individual has won the pinnacle of, of competitions training on something that is a, I don't want to say a rudimentary piece of equipment, but it's one step above training on bands. So if people can get over the fact of, if I don't have this, you know, if, if I'm not training on this equipment, then I can't do this. If you can lower that vibration and you can remove those those roadblocks and go, oh, instead of I can't, oh, I can do this, this, and this, and I can manipulate this, this, and this, you're going to allow yourself a much greater results, a much faster rate, because once you believe it, you will achieve it. All right, so what, I, what I'm hearing you say is what you're telling me is that if I want to be a successful bodybuilder, I have to buy a Bowflex. <laughs> Basically, so I hope Bowflex sees this and uh, they contact me. <laughs> I can rant about that, this idea that lightweight makes your muscles toned, for example, or uh, the piece of equipment that you use will change how the muscles develop is, is very frustrating for me to think about. But uh, um, here's an amazing example, right? Here's, here's a great example for you. Military. Mm, yeah. Right? right? You go to basic. How many push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups do you do? And how differently does everyone look when they come out, right? Endless, right? So literally, you didn't even touch a machine. All you did was body weight for X amount of weeks. And all of a sudden, you look completely different. So adding any type of resistance, I don't care what resistance, any type of resistance is going to garnish production if implemented. I still won't hesitate to buy other home gym equipment or go to a commercial gym just because it's not because I think that the results are superior here or there. It's for me, as you were actually starting to touch on earlier, it's the mental approach. For me, I might just personally like something better or so that I don't start to feel run down. I just need to change my environment. You know, for a week, I need to go to a commercial gym and not train at home because that's how it's going to keep my mind fresh. That's how it's going to keep me interested and keep my intensity level up. Or if, I'm, if I've been in a commercial gym too long, I might need to take a vacation from that and just train at home for a little while. And it's, you know, with that being said, you know, that's part of how, why I even started doing the whole, you know, group leg days on Saturdays was, you know, <clears throat> just that camaraderie. Like what I have found is, on those days, like I was pushing so much harder when I knew there were three, five, seven, 12 other individuals watching me train. And so like, not only am I gonna train harder for, for myself, but now I'm training harder for them. And you know, they, they would all talk about how crazy leg day was. And I was like, oh damn, well, I, I, I gotta make this harder next time. So the next time we do something different and you know, just just be a half percent crazier, half percent crazier. And before you know it, like leg days are an hour and 45 minutes long. There's 35, 40 people showing up and we are just doing crazy stuff. And, and it was like you just said, it was that mental side of like having that motivation, seeing other people around you, you know? And then there's times too where I enjoy when I go into the gym and there's no one there. It's just me. I can crank out a workout. I get left alone. There's, there's something, uh, uh, borderline religious, spiritual in that moment of just being me, having my headphones on, it's me against the weights, there's no one there. Um, you know, so whatever your jam is, like you gotta find that and, and be good in it or your, or your workouts will absolutely suffer. A lot of it is just, is the mental aspect. It's not just, 
I mean, there's a lot, as you said, we could do a whole video on the mentality behind these things and the mental approach, but even just something as simple as doing what's going to work for you in a sense of what, what's realistic, you know, the best diet it has been said is the one that you're actually going to stick with or the best workout. Well, which one are you going to stick with? Because if you come up with a theoretical diet for somebody that could theoretically be perfect for them, but mentally they it's so difficult for them with their schedule or with their mentality or whatever else that they never end up following it well then that best workout just or that best diet just went to waste and it's the same with a workout if you give them all these exercises and all these machines that that just doesn't click with them and they hate it then they're either going to do it very lazily to get it over with or they're just not going to do it at all they're going to skip it in which case it was a waste of time some people say well what's better they want to know the, the facts what's better is it better you know, hormone wise and, you know, circadian rhythm, all these things like, is it better to train in the morning or in the evening? I'd say, well, which do you prefer? Are you going to go to the gym all the time and not miss workouts if I say the morning or if I say the evening? Because whatever's going to keep you in the gym consistently is, is your answer. That's what you need to do. Yeah. It's uh, at the end of the day, it is about bringing intense intentionality to whatever you're doing. Again, whether that's your eating, whether that's your lifting, whether that's work, whether whatever that is, you, you need to bring a, a high level intentionality with it um, or else it's just, it's just not going to be beneficial for you. I know uh, we already discussed this, but I need to mention it one more time because it is such a controversial topic on my channel and for a lot of people is the rep thing. Coming from a strength training background, I never did high reps. I, I very rarely did more than eight reps. And my version of high reps was sometimes I would do 16 reps, maybe 20 every once in a while. But I remember uh, when I was coming back from my, my, my injury and I was starting to get into it and I was trying to, you know, take a different approach to my training, not so much strength based. And you suggested these, these higher rep sets, you know, 40 to 60 reps. And when I heard it, I, I got to admit, I was, I was angry at you. Mm -hmm. Like in my head, I just, there was this knee jerk reaction because I know how it feels. It hurts. You have this panic survival instinct in your head where you start going above a certain rep amount and your body starts trying to convince you that you're dying, that everything is wrong, that it's the worst thing possible, for the love <laughs> of God, stop. And I could already feel that coming up in my body and I wasn't even doing it yet. You know, when, when, you, when you look and you, you watch back and you see like Tom Platts, and you know, this guy was known for, for massive reps, for doing 100 rep sets on barbell squat, and, and you look at his legs, you know, it is mind bogging to think of how much you know, when you're when you're doing a movement, and you touched on this earlier, your your muscle doesn't necessarily understand weight. It understands on and off. It's not like a dimmer switch, right? So it only understands fiber recruitment. And so when you're doing a weight and you're trying to hit a slow twitch muscle fiber, because slow twitch is going to grow larger than fast twitch, when you're hitting that fiber for 100 reps, and staying in that, again, it doesn't necessarily understand the weight, it understands the time under tension. And like the amount of, of output in a 100 rep set, like when, when you're benching 300 pounds 10 times, you got 300 pounds of, of kinetic output, right? Well, if you drop to 200 pounds and you do it 20 times, now all of a sudden you've got 4,000 pounds of kinetic output. Well, now let's think about this. Let's say that you did 75 pounds a hundred times. Well, there was 7,500 pounds of kinetic output. Which one's gonna have more fiber recruitment? Well, obviously the hundred reps. So when you start scientifically understanding that output, it starts to make more sense why these guys are, are using these massive loads. Now that doesn't mean that I don't train heavy either. Yeah, I, I absolutely utilize eight and 12 rep sets, but I also really heavily rely on that 40, 60, 80, 100 rep sets. We did a leg day, I'm not exaggerating. I literally started with 20 reps for my first one. Then I did 40, then I did 80, then I did 160. And I literally did my last set at 320 consecutive reps. 
I thought the group was absolutely going to kill me. Did it hurt? Yup. Did we make it? Yup. <laughs> but like when you think about the massive amount of output in that time frame, it's it's incredible how much pressure or tensions put on that muscle. And what's the other side that I like about when you're doing these high reps like this that that I think a lot of people sometimes forget about, you can't do as much weight. Well, if you can't do as much weight, guess what you're saving wear and tear on? Joints. You're not destroying your knees, you're not destroying your hips, you're not destroying your shoulders, you're not destroying your elbows. So there, there's a lot of benefit to those high reps other than just the byproduct of looking for, for of, of hypertrophy. Well, also the secondary effect that your body has to fuel that. So even if you're, you're in it for the fat burning benefits, it's going to recruit, it's going to utilize more of those fat resources. It's gonna burn more through that, whatever you're eating that day, it's gonna burn more calories having to fuel a 100 rep set than a 10 rep set. Absolutely. And, and I think that's actually an interesting point to bring up. You know, when I'm training on my leg days, um, I usually put between 100 and 150 grams of fast acting carbs with 14 grams of BCAAs in a drink that I'm drinking throughout my leg day because when, when you're using, your, your body is just guzzling glycogen storage because basically your, your body takes glycogen and turns it to ATP as, as, as you know, and that's what it uses for energy. Well, in order to make it through something like that, I've got to replenish those cells, you know, in the, as I'm doing that or I'm never going to make it because you are at some point going to get to a point where you're going to be breaking down muscle versus using body fat or stored glycogen as energy. Um, so I'm, I'm very cautious, even dieting, even show prep. I, I actually don't take it out until very late in my training because not only do I not take it out, but I'll, I'll reduce it. Like I may be, I may go from where I'm doing 150 grams of carbs through my workout now to maybe down to 50, maybe down to 30, but I'm still doing some type of glyco glycogen replenish during my workout to make sure that I'm not getting myself in a catabolic state. And sometimes I think intra-workout stuff is is overlooked when we start talking about nutrition and, and energy output as well. We're gonna give more of your information later on. I'm gonna be linking people to you, but um, can you, are you on Instagram? I am on Instagram. Um, right now I'm at, it's actually MRT Recovery. Um, that is that is my main uh, I'm using right now. I'm actually doing a social media fast. So my actual uh, personal page is down uh, for one more day, um, but it is uh, IFBB uh, underscore Ben Barkus. Um, so it will be back up and I'll make sure that I get that, that information over to you as well. And um, obviously you are Ben Barkus, you are an IFBB pro. Uh, you've got a gym. Yes, so my wife and I own a gym in uh, Fishers, Indiana. Uh, well, technically speaking, my wife owns a gym in Fishers, Indiana, as far as the state of Indiana is concerned, and the LLCs go. Um, it is about 8,500 square foot. It is it is the epitome of the old school uh, barbell garage gym. That's kind of how we designed it. Uh, no AC, uh, it's got a small heater in it. So like during the summer, doors are open 24 seven. I do kind of, I put chain link over the back doors, but doors are still open. So it, uh, it is definitely that old school, you know, Mecca Scott style gym. Um, hell, I mean, we, we've probably got at this point eight or 10 IFBB pros that train out of there. We've got a ton of powerlifters that are out in and out of there. Um, one of my trainers actually played on the US dodgeball team. Um, just an interesting, eclectic group of athletes that, that we've been blessed enough to have at the, at, at the facility. Yeah, like I said, there's, there's a lot more stuff we could talk about, a lot more things we could cover. Um, you've got your gym, um, you and your wife are, I, I, I'm really bummed we didn't get to talk to Amanda this time because I think Amanda would also have a lot of great insight for the viewers. She's, she's a wealth of knowledge on her own. Yeah, she is. We, we'll, we'll have to do it again and bring her in on this. If somebody watching this video wants to contact you directly, is there a way to do that? Um, best way to do it is through my email. Um, it's very, very difficult. It's benbarkus at gmail.com. So I, I, right, like I've had that thing literally for years. Um, that's probably the easiest. Uh, they can contact me through MRT as well. Uh, they can just send me a message there. Um, I used to have a site for online, but I've changed so much that uh, I just, I kind of got rid of it. 
you can contact me through the Barkus Fitness, uh, dot com. Um, it's going to just be a little delay because actually going to go through one of my staff or through my wife versus the MRT or the Ben at uh, or the Ben Barkus at Gmail is going to come right to my phone. I think I hope we've covered a little bit of everything. There are a lot of these topics I wish we could kind of dedicate or speak more about in depth. I at some point in the future, if we can coordinate the time to do another video. Uh, I wish we could do an entire video just on on your aspect of, of, of Barkus and MRT and all those things because um, unlike, I mean, I've been to gyms all over the world and I can honestly say with no bias that your specific setup and your approach and what you offer, not even just like with the MRT stuff, but even just the the environment of your gym, the community, just the whole approach is, is very unique. It's one of a kind. I've never seen anything like it, but um, at this at this point, the video is is getting long, and I got to do some editing. But uh, I wanted to thank you again for doing the video. And um, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I've I've had a blast. It's been a lot of fun. We've obviously covered a lot of material, and and I feel like you, your surpri- subscribers are probably going to have some questions. Uh, so I, I would I think I think it'd be fun to get on here and do do another video or two. I'd love to explain the new acts a little bit more in detail. Maybe maybe get some footage of of doing it and maybe answer some more questions for your for your followers. That would be awesome. I would appreciate that. Absolutely. So yeah, let's uh, let's make that happen. All right. Well, thanks for talking, Ben. And uh, until next time, I will see you later. Absolutely, brother. Appreciate it. Have a good one.